Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. And now I am anxious to continue our reading and discussion of the book, the most prophetic book that I've ever read, in having to do with the Pope's rise to world supremacy in the New World Order. This book, written in 1876 by R. W. Thompson, Secretary of the U.S. Navy. Amazing revelation in this book. Understanding what the papacy represented as a threat to our Protestant institutions in this country. And for the reading this morning, I'd like to suggest the readers keep in as a background for the discussion this morning the text of Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. And I'll, I'll begin by reading those. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 15. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend above, uh, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will be, uh, excuse me, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Pretty arrogant, don't you think? Pretty blasphemous, don't you think? And yet, here is, here is the Father of heaven, his response to this false prophecy of Lucifer. He says in verse 15, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Okay? Satan is a false prophet. He believes that he will be like God on the earth. And he attempts to fulfill that false prophecy in the papacy. And we know how this is going to end. It is prophesied by the great prophet Isaiah in verse 15 of chapter 14. Yet you shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. You're not going to have your way, Lucifer. You'll not win in the end. You may deceive a lot of people, but I, and only I, am the King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, we're going to get back to the text of this book, The Papacy and the Civil Power. If you're following along, page 138, the first full paragraph on the page. We're speaking of an author that wrote having to do with the temporal or kingly power of the Pope. You see, the Pope asserts himself to be king of kings and lord of lords. This is Satan's fulfillment of his false prophecy in Isaiah chapter 14, that Satan, through the papacy, attempts to exalt his throne above the stars of God, to be like the Most High. Now this author, says R.W. Thompson, demonstrates the character of the papal theory still further by showing that the Pope is a king, not because he is ever made so by the people anywhere, even in the papal states, but because he is Pope and as head of the church, holds the papal states for the good of the church. In other words, he is autonomous. He does not receive his temporal crown from the people. He's not elected by the people. He doesn't need the assent of any person on earth to be king of the world. He arrogates to himself his throne as though it were given to him by God himself. He is above every human being, 
He is above every group of human beings. He is above every government. He's above the heights of the stars. He's above the throne of God Almighty. And we must just simply obey, unquestioningly. That's what it says. That's what this author is declaring about the papacy. Having once been finally, as a matter of dogma, declared infallible, Pope Pius IX was declared infallible in 1870 at the First Vatican Council. The papacy reached the pinnacle of its divine arrogations, its blasphemies. Now he says, therefore, he says again, quote, he is not a foreign power in that sense of the word, still holding fast to the idea that the kingship of the Pope is necessary wherever he is the head of the church. The meaning is still the same as before, that he cannot be Pope without being a king also, that although he is a foreign prince insofar that he wears the crown of a foreign country, that is, Vatican City, which is indeed a country, yet he is not so in any country to his followers who owe him the obedience of a domestic king, that as the Roman Catholic Church cannot exist without a pope, it cannot exist without a king, and that wheresoever there are Roman Catholics, no matter under what government, they must obey this Pope King, even at the hazard of disobedience to the laws that protect their persons and property, when he shall consider it necessary to the welfare of the Roman Catholic Church to remove these out of the way. In other words, even at the hazard of violating the rules of the, the laws of the land in which they live and bringing themselves out from under the protection and welfare of that government, they must obey the Pope, even at the risk of their own lives, because he is King of kings and Lord of lords. And as we get further in this chapter, he's not only the King of Catholics, he's the King of everybody. Now, continuing, he says, hence, to illustrate the principle practically, if it were possible for a Roman Catholic government to invade the United States in order to carry on a crusade for the destruction of the infidelity and heresy of Protestantism, and the Pope should command all his followers here to take up arms against the government, to aid in that crusade, and thus to serve God and the church, as he would undoubtedly do if he acted according to his professed convictions, it would be their, quote, first duty, unquote, to obey him, the Pope, because for such a purpose he is not, in the, he is not a foreign prince, but a domestic one, by virtue of his being in the place of God on earth, and possessing the same universality of authority. So, reiterating once again, no one can consider the Pope a foreign potentate. He is omnipresent. He's the first citizen of every country, because he stands as a representative of Christ. No one can legitimately call him a foreign interference. He's a domestic everywhere, giving himself, the arrogating to himself the divine quality of omnipresence. Now, it is scarcely necessary to say that, says R.W. Thompson, in this supposed case, that is, of a Roman Catholic, inva uh, a Roman Catholic country invading the United States to put down this heresy called Protestantism, that the Pope would command every Catholic in this country. He says it is scarcely necessary to say that in this supposed case, there are many thousands of Roman Catholic laymen in the United States who would refuse to obey such a command were it ever issued by the Pope. 
For then they would realize, then they would realize how insensibly and unsuspectingly they have been drawn along after the papal car toward the edge of a precipice over which they could not plunge without destruction. They would then, as the Roman Catholic people of Italy have done, begin to see that wherever absolutism has had its own way, under the claim of divine right, it has been oppressive and tyrannical. They would also realize that their first duty was to the government that had protected them in all their religious, social, and political rights, which the papacy has never done. But while there are thousands of such as these, both native and foreign-born, it cannot be disguised that the bulk, if not all of the Roman Catholic hierarchy in this country, and virtually every single Jesuit in this country, would obey the papal command. Or, if there should be one refusing, he would be denounced, anathematized, and excommunicated by the Pope. So, what can we take from what R.W. Thompson just said? The same thing that I've often said here on Inquisition Update, and that is, this truth that is uttered on Inquisition Update is as much for Catholics as it is for Protestants, because history reveals that whenever the, the temporal power of the Pope has been diminished in the world, it was by the hand of Roman Catholics. They simply rebelled against their church. They rebelled against the temporal power of the Pope. They rebelled against the Jesuits, and they cast the Jesuits out of their countries, and they proclaimed liberty. This is the very basis of the Protestant Reformation. They got sick and tired of tyranny. They got sick and tired of blasphemy. They realized the papacy was none other than Satan's vicar on earth. And they found Christ. And they made their allegiance with Christ. They swore to obey Christ and to disobey Antichrist. Remember, the Protestant Reformation was largely Roman Catholics who rebelled against the papacy. And I say today, while the Protestants are flinging themselves headlong over the precipice of ecumenism, that is, uniting with the Roman Catholic Church, there are many thinking, intelligent, common-sense Catholics who are beginning to realize that it is their church that is causing the government of the United States to become tyrannical. They're beginning to realize the influence that the Jesuit order has on politics in this country, and that our rights are being taken away by their church through its influence in high-profile Roman Catholics in Washington, D.C., and then many, many, many who are hiding behind the cloak of religion and secretly controlling our government. We review this history on Inquisition Update to make it apparent that much of the reversal that I hope to see take place in this country, as unlikely as it may be, would come from wise Catholics who will repudiate their church and see, finally, that their church, to which they their whole lives have been loyal, to come to the realization that that church is plunging them into tyranny and tearing, tearing away from them the Protestant liberties that Protestantism has brought them. Catholics will begin to realize that it's people like Joseph Biden, Roman Catholic, that Nancy Pelosi, Roman Catholic, that all the Roman Catholics in government are the ones behind this destruction of liberty and finally admit to themselves their Roman Catholic Church, their church, their Roman Catholic hierarchy, their bishops, their archbishops, their priests and prelates, 
are waging a war against a country they love. This is what happened in all the Roman Catholic countries. In Europe, that's why they cast out the Jesuits. That's why they cast out the Pope. My hope... And many, many say that I'm a Catholic basher, that I, that I hate Roman Catholics. Many Roman Catholics are my hope. If, if, if wisdom is ever going to come to this country, it might well as be from Catholics as Protestants who repent of the ecumenical movement. Never forget that the Protestant Reformation was largely Roman Catholic before they saw the light. Now, he said they would then, as the Roman Catholic people of Italy have done, begin to see that wherever absolutism has had its own way, that is, wherever papacy has had its own way, under the claim of divine right, it has been oppressive and tyrannical they would also realize that their first duty was to the government that had protected them in all their religious, social, and political rights, which the papacy has never done. But while there are thousands such as these, both native and foreign-born, it, can it cannot be disguised that the bulk, if not all, of the Roman Catholic hierarchy and every single Jesuit would obey the papal command. And that's why I say that every Roman Catholic hierarch in this country, every Jesuit priest particularly, should, as Christopher Strunk recommends, be registered under the Logan Act as representatives and diplomats of a foreign king. They should be viewed as spies in this country. They should be viewed as a shadow government, which they are. And they should be expelled. Lock, stock, and barrel. Mark an X on the calendar. You've got 20 days to quit the country. Take your possessions, whatever you can carry, and get on that boat. And don't stop till the wind stops blowing. This is a Protestant nation. We will not be Catholicized either directly or indirectly by your influence. This country grew out of Protestantism, out of a necessity to rid itself of papal tyranny. And you will not bring papal tyranny to these shores. We're going to do as did the Italian people and oust you from our presence. And if you love and worship that Pope so much, then you can find out where Vatican City is and take up the, your occupancy and your occupation there and leave us be. Now, if R. W. Thompson was as reckless as me, that's what he would say. But he's a little more mild-mannered than I am. He says, see how this author clings to his favorite idea when elsewhere he thus expresses himself, quote, If we take a glance at the history of the popes, we shall see plainly how God has made temporal sovereignty a, necess a necessary accompaniment. Now, I want to define temporal sovereignty means universal kingship. Okay. God has made the universal kingship of the Pope a, necessar a necessary accompaniment of their spiritual sovereignty so that it grows out of it. In other words, the temporal power of the Pope grows out of his spiritual power, and it belongs to it as its natural right. In other words, it's the natural right that if the Pope be a priest... He must be a king. He can't impose his, his priestly dogma if he doesn't have the physical wherewithal to strangle your neck into submission. Right? 
It says, in the early ages of the Roman Catholic Church, God was pleased to give a manifest testimony of her divine origin by miraculously supporting her and extending her limits without any human power. In other words, God rose up the Roman Catholic Church. And in spite of superhuman obstacles, her very existence, the very existence of the Roman Catholic Church, and much more her growth under such circumstances, was a miracle. It ceased with her infancy. But when she reached maturity, God supplied her with temporal sovereignty, which through no part of her essence, though no part of her essence, is nevertheless her natural and proper mode of action, and as such, her right. So in the beginning, God was the temporal power of the, of the Roman Catholic Church, and he protected her and raised her. But now that she's mature... God has arrogated that temporal power to the Pope. And now it's out of God's hands and it's in the Pope's hands. And if God gave that temporal power to the Pope, no power on earth has the right to strip it from his hands. You see where he's going with this? So the temporal power, the kingly power of the Pope, his power to coerce, his power to prosecute, his power to persecute, his power to destroy utterly his power to torture his power to burn you at the stake was given to him by God and it is her right to use it nay her obligation to rout heresy out from under the stars now what an admirable specimen of consistent and methodical reasoning is this. The idea that when the Roman Catholic Church was weak and feeble, compelled to struggle against the powerful pagan governments which had obtained the mastery over the world, God left it to make its way without any human power. But that after it reached maturity and became strong, it could not exist without having temporal sovereignty conferred upon its popes is to say, at the least of it, a wonderful exhibition of sagacity and originality. The truth is, and history, history abundantly proves it, apart from this confession that throughout the early ages of Christianity, when Christians at Rome and elsewhere were known by the purity of their lives and not by mere professions, there was no such thing as the temporal sovereignty of the popes. Each bishop had jurisdiction over his own church, at Rome, as well as, in as at Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, Corinth, and other places. Now, now before I even go any further, <laughs> I don't disagree with R. W. Thompson very often. But right here, R. W. Thompson makes a fatal mistake. He believes the, the Oriental Roman Catholic Church was the Church of Jesus Christ, founded by Jesus Christ, and that early... It held to the faith of Jesus Christ. I don't believe that at all. The Church of Rome is the Church of Simon Magus. It had no pristine beginnings. The pagan Romans persecuted the Christians, and so did Christian Rome, and it still does today. It is not the Church of Christ that has been, that has lately been corrupted as R.W. Thompson asserts here, it has always been corrupt and has persecuted God's true people throughout its entire history. And that's its prerogative. It claims it for himself. Remember the Apostle Paul started the Church of Jesus Christ in Rome. And the Roman Christians believed as Paul taught and they held to the faith of Jesus Christ. They never persecuted anybody. But that church of Jesus Christ in Rome, started by Paul, the true church of Jesus Christ, was displaced by the counterfeit church of Christ, that of Simon Magus. Remember, he was baptized. Everybody believed him to be a Christian. 
until he sought to buy the power to impart the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands. And the apostle Peter said, your money perish with you. And he was exposed as an apostate, as a, an infiltrator of the church of Jesus Christ, and he corrupted a lot of people. And they departed from the true church of Jesus Christ and set about starting their own church. That church migrated to Rome, the center of the religious world, and set up shop. It is now known as the universal church. The church of Jesus Christ at Rome is the true church, and they were displaced, persecuted by the Simoniacs, persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church. History bears this out. The true church of Jesus Christ fled into the wilderness. And where did they flee? To the Alps in northern Italy and western France. That's where the gospel was preserved. They were persecuted people. The Roman Catholic Church, the Church of Simon Magus, pursued them until they killed nearly every last one of them. And they've been killing God's people ever since. They're killing God's people today. An Inquisition update is warning God's people that the church of Simon Magus, the synagogue of Satan, is still seeking to kill God's people, to rout them out of the earth. And that battlefield has come to America. R.W. Thompson perceives it. Now, he may be minorly... Uh, incorrect with this point that he makes right here in this chapter, that the early church of Rome was the church of Jesus Christ, but it was not. The early church of Rome, the true church of Jesus Christ, fled and was displaced by what is now known as the Roman Catholic Church. He's confusing the two, and many people do. He just simply believes that somewhere along the line, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, accounting for its pure beginnings, so-called, had become corrupt somewhere along the way. No, they didn't have the same beginning with the true church at Rome that Paul, st that Paul uh, started. Now, after having laboriously covered that, will return to the text. He says, the truth is, and history abundantly proves it, apart from this confession, that throughout the early ages of Christianity, when Christians at Rome and elsewhere were known by their purity of their lives and not by mere professions, there was no such thing as the temporal sovereignty of the popes. Each bishop had jurisdiction over his own church at Rome, as well as Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, Corinth, and other places. But when Emperor Constantine set the example of uniting church and state, now this was not the church of Jesus Christ, but the church of Simon Magus that was united with the Constantinian state. He says, when Constantine set the example of uniting church and state by supporting the church at Rome upon the condition that it would sustain his claim to dominion over the Italian people, then the bishops of Rome began to arrogate to themselves this temporal sovereignty now asserted so earnestly. They acquired it in the end without regard to the number of people who were crushed to the, to the earth and succeeded in placing both the spiritual and temporal sword in their hands. Now, this gets directly to what Paul warned about. Paul was warning the true church of Jesus Christ that he who now restrains will restrain until he's taken out of the way. Okay? Constantine was that power. He was the restrainer, was keeping the Antichrist church from coming to power. And when he united church and state... He became a priest king, and when, when Constantine left Rome at the crumble of the Roman Empire, that power was transferred to the popes. Now the popes see themselves in his position of authority, both a priest and a king. 
And that's where we get the word pope. Okay, he's a priest king, a god man, like Nebuchadnezzar, and like Pharaoh, and like Baal. A priest king. United church and state. And it's not the church of Jesus Christ. This is not the way God intended it. He said, Christ said, he hated the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. Okay? So, the papacy is just an outgrowth of he that restrained. And when he was taken out of the way, the Pope took, the papacy took its place. The Antichrist took its place. The man of sin, the son of perdition. Now, it's not taught this way in the Protestant churches today, but they're apostate. I'm not understanding what the Protestant reformers taught and what history attests. Okay, they're looking for a future fulfillment of this, when in fact it was fulfilled in history, just as Paul predicted. Paul said, he who now restrains will restrain until he's taken out of the way. Paul knew who he was talking about. He was talking about the Caesars of Rome that, that then controlled Jerusalem. He understood the prophecies of Daniel. There be four beasts upon the earth. And when they're over, when they, they are finished, they will be destroyed by Christ. Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Greece, and then Rome. Rome was in power at the time Paul was speaking. He said, he who now restrains will restrain until he's taken away. That fourth and final Gentile beast was in power at the time of Christ and at the time of Paul, the establishment of the true church of Jesus Christ. That's the Roman Caesar, who is now the Pope. And that Roman Empire is still in place today, killing God's people. Now, God's people fled to the mountains. They fled to the Alps, the Waldenses. They were called the Valley People. And through that, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ was preserved. Okay? R.W. Thompson is mistaken about this. There was no pristine beginning of the universal Roman Catholic Church. It was satanic from the very beginning. It is situated on the hill of divination. In Rome, Vatican Hill, that's what it means, divination, the hill of divination. It's situated on the, the ancient burial site of uh, pagan sorcerers. There was no pristine beginning to the Roman Catholic Church. It has no standing with the Church of Jesus Christ. It is denounced as the Church of Antichrist. So say the Protestant Reformers, so say I. So say the scriptures, and so says history. So if you feel offended that someone speaks the truth about the Roman Catholic Church, don't be offended. Just accept the truth. Or repudiate it. Find out where I err. Now, obviously, R.W. Thompson has made an error, and we need to correct it. Understanding that Constantine was that power that restrained the rise of the papacy, and when he left Rome, the papacy stood up in his place claiming his dominion over the Italian people and the rest of the world, and they called themselves the Bishop of Rome, and they began to arrogate to themselves the temporal sovereignty now asserted so earnestly by the papacy, particularly at the time of the writing of this book, Pope Pius IX, the first officially infallible pope of the Roman Catholic Church. It's Antichrist come to power. They can make no mistake about it. And he says they acquire it in the end without regard to the number of people who are crushed to the earth and succeeded in placing both the spiritual and the temporal sword in their hands, the Pope's hands. And that sword is represented by the two keys on the papal flag. That is his spiritual sword and his temporal sword. And they both draw blood. And they've drawn the blood of the saints since the very beginning. It says, for hundreds of years, these swords rested but little in their scabbards until mankind were weakened to a sense of duty and 
uh, were awakened to a sense of duty and manhood by the great Protestant Reformation. That's when the world woke up. Seeing the earth soaked with the blood of the saints, the Roman Catholics rebelled against the Roman Catholic Church and started the Protestant Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. You are not Pope. You are not King. You are Antichrist. And we take back to ourselves the gospel from the priest's hands. Now we can read it for ourselves. We take Christ back from you, and we place him on his rightful throne, both on the earth and in our hearts. That's the very essence of the Protestant Reformation. The very essence of the Protestant Reformation was the unanimous recognition that the papacy was, in fact, the biblical and historical Antichrist. You take away that realization, and you don't have a Protestant Reformation. And this information, this knowledge, is so sorely lacking in the evangelical churches in this country. That's why they've succumbed to the ecumenical movement in the first place. They now see the papacy as the end-all and be-all of Christianity, the chief king of Christianity. And we must unite the whole Christian world in defense of Christianity under the great leadership of the Pope. This is the, the death of the Protestant Reformation. This is putting Christ out of his rightful throne, both on the earth and in the hearts of men, and putting the Pope in his place. Common sense dictates that the ecumenical movement be abandoned by anyone who calls himself Christian, that the Roman Catholic Church be abandoned by everyone calling himself Roman Catholic. If he truly loves Jesus Christ, he must hate his enemy. R.W. Thompson consider, uh, continues, he says, From that time to the present, The nations have gradually thrown off the thraldom of the papacy and bounded into new life. This is what took place at the time of the Protestant Reformation. People threw off the papal yoke. They threw off the thraldom of the papacy and bounded to new life. New life in Christ. Yet, with all this experience before us, the American Roman Catholic hierarchy are now striving to bind the limbs of the American people with the rusty old chains which have been so nobly broken. And I will add, by the Protestant Reformation. This author finds himself supported by other high authority, the Roman Catholic Bishop of Orleans in France... He represents this prelate when speaking of the Pope as a monarchist, of course, and and to have said, quote, In fact, it is necessary that his action, that is, the Pope's action, his will, his decrees, his word, and his sacred person shall enjoy the full and free exercise of authority, rising above all influences, all interests, all human passions, so that neither discontented interest nor irritated passion should have even the shadow of a right to raise complaints against him. Unquote. How dare you raise your voice against the papacy? He's God's representative on earth. That's what the Bishop of Orleans said. The Bishop of Orleans might as well have added, that the Pope should rise above all governments, too, for this is involved in what he says. This author so understands him, or he would not have spoken of the papacy as he does when he says, quote, The papacy is the soul of the world. It is the papacy which, deserve, uh, which preserves it from moral decay and death. Did you hear that? It is the, pa- the papacy... The bloody papacy that preserves the world from moral decay and death. Look at the lives of the history of the papacies that we read in Vickers of Christ, the dark side of the papacy. You never saw a more depraved line of human beings in your life than you've seen 
through the history of the popes, the lives of the popes. And death, crusade after crusade, inquisition after inquisition. And here he has, the, this, this Bishop of Orleans has the audacity to say that the papacy preserves the world from moral decay and death. He says further, the papacy is the very keystone of Christian society and is the salt of the earth, the city on a hill, the candle upon a candlestick shining before the whole world. Does anybody, when I just read that last part, do, do you see any similarity between these words uttered by the Bishop of Orleans and the words uttered by George H.W. Bush in his State of the Union address when he declared the New World Order? Didn't he talk about a thousand points of light? Didn't Bill Clinton, Jesuit trained Bill Clinton, talk about that shining city on a hill? They're talking about the Roman Catholic Church. How familiar are these words? And they were uttered by a priest of Orleans in France. And he, the, the book continues, he says, Nor would he have republished the following from the London tablet, a leading papal organ in, in England, to show that the destruction of the temporal power of the Pope, that is, the destruction of the kingly power of the Pope, is, quote, a crime which merits the sentence of excommunication, unquote. The tablet, speaking of the loss of his kingship by the Pope, says, quote, it is, in other words, to dethrone the only authority upon earth to which the Roman Catholic can look for guidance in doubt. To oust his jurisdiction, the only judge, to oust out of his jurisdiction, the only judge, whose decisions are framed in the presence of God, to place the world above the church, which God has placed above the world, and to renew under a pseudo-Christianity the desolation of paganism. There you have it. You unseat the Pope, you've unseated the only divine authority on the, on the earth, and you've reduced the whole world to paganism. It's either popery or paganism. Which do you have it? That's how it's viewed in the mind and the hearts of an Orthodox Roman Catholic, a Tridentine Council of Trent, traditional Roman Catholic. It's either popery or paganism. Take your choice. Now, all this we have plainly and distinctly avowed that the authority which the Pope acquires by virtue of his possession of temporal power is absolutely necessary to his government of the Church, and that this is the foundation of his claim to obedience. The temporal power arising out of the spiritual is no less than the spiritual of divine origin. It, and as it is this which makes the Pope a king, therefore the obedience of the faithful to him is the obedience of the subject to the monarch. It must follow, consequently, that wherever so, wheresoever the Pope does not possess this temporal power, he is not free to govern the church as he pleases, and the church is not free to obey his commands. See, when the Roman Catholic Church talks about freedom and liberty, that's what they're talking about. Free to be Catholic. Free to obey the Pope without interference from any Protestant or anybody else, for that matter. It says, when therefore the papal advocates in this country, uh, the papal advocates in this country talk about the freedom of the Pope, the freedom of the Church, and all that sort of thing, they actually mean that the Pope should have the unquestioned right to command as a temporal prince and that they should have the unquestioned right to obey him no matter what stood in their way. His temporal power, says the London tablet, makes him, quote, the only judge whose decisions are framed in the presence of God, 
unquote. Otherwise, the abolition of it would be merely a political offense and not a crime against God worthy of excommunication. If, then, it requires this temporal power to raise the church above the world so that the papacy may preserve it from decay and death, the Pope must judge of temporals as well as spirituals over all over the world. In other words, the Pope's kingdom is not complete unless it includes every square inch of the planet. That's been the cry of the papacy ever since. I am king of the world, not just of Catholics, but of the whole world. As Christ is king of the whole world, so am I. And he says, such was the doctrine of the Jesuits before the Lateran decree of papal infallibility was passed, and the papacy is now struggling with wonderful energy to make it the doctrine of the whole Roman Catholic world. Nobody will deny that to concede, to the po concede the Pope's infallibility is equivalent to recognizing the obligation to do within the entire circle of faith and morals whatsoever he shall command to be done. All the important acts of individuals and society are necessarily within his circle so that the whole man in all that he does and thinks as a social being and as a citizen, becomes by this doctrine subject to this obedience. Whatever position he may fill in any of the relations of life, if he be a Christian, he acknowledges his responsibility to God and his obligation to obey God's law. That law, therefore, must regulate all his intercourse with the world and encompass the whole field of his duty. Hence, as the devotee of infallibility looks to the Pope alone for the interpretation of the law of God, he consents to obey him in whatsoever he shall declare it to be. He looks no farther. He debates nothing. The Pope, with him, possesses the concentration of his own hands of all the power of heaven and earth, and sits upon so lofty a throne that no human being dares to challenge the integrity of his motives or the propriety and expediency of his decrees. He considers him as occupying a judgment seat before which all mankind must pass in review. He therefore accepts what the Pope does and says as infallibly right and true. He makes no inquiry about it. But closing his mind to all investigation and thought, he passively submits to think and to do everything the Pope shall decree and pronounces all to be heretics and disbelievers in Christianity who doubt or deny the virtue and propriety of his submission. No matter what the doctrine he is required to believe or the thing he is, he is required to do, his obedience must be complete. The Catholic world thus states it, quote, Each individual must receive the faith and law from the church, that is, the Pope, of which he is a member by baptism, without questioning submission and obedience of the intellect and the will. That's right. You have become a cadaver because you've been baptized into the Roman Catholic Church. Check your brain and your Bible and the Holy Spirit at the door. Just come in and do and think and believe whatever the Pope tells you to do. This is ultramontane Roman Catholicism. It is taking over the United States from the top down. It's the New World Order. And we'll talk more about it on the program tomorrow, an extensive and very appropriate note that the author gives us at this point, and we'll cover that tomorrow on the broadcast. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Inquisition Update. I'll see you tomorrow.